Hello, we're back with the Arturia DX7V for Sonic Academy. My name is Matt Thomas, also King Unique. Um, I'm going to take you through the different sections of the overview tab now. We're going to start looking at the, the main kind of operator control area along with the algorithm window here. Then we'll move on to the actual uh, parameters for each operator, which are in this section. And finally, we'll go on to the uh, global controls, which are kind of this section here and this section here. So the heart of the DX7V really are the six operators. They're here in this little section, they're color coded and how they're arranged, how they're linked together is shown in the, the same algorithm diagram that was initially come up with by Yamaha for the DX7. If you flick through here, you can see that the wiring between the operators is different for each algorithm. This is kind of familiar stuff, I think, to anybody who's had a look at FM previously because this is the, uh, the kind of heart of the entire synthesizer. I'm going to work on algorithm one for a while. Now there's some nice simple graphic interface ideas that Arturia have implemented to enhance this algorithm diagram. First of all, you can bypass or mute operators with a right click. So here we go, if we want to switch an operator off, off it goes, off it goes. And what you can see over here on the algorithm is that muted operators are greyed out. And if I click them back on and you keep an eye on the algorithm, you'll see colours return to them. Now you'll also notice that operator 1 is a black box with colour around the outside of the number 1 in green as the green here indicates, but the other operators are all kind of filled in with their colour. Now this is an idea that uh, Arturia have implemented that shows you the level of that operator. If I pull the level of 1 back you'll see it's starting to grey out until we get down at which point it's doing nothing. With the level is zero, whether it's a carrier or a modulator, when you're at zero, nothing's happening. So. so you've always got a reference here when you glance at this algorithm diagram, if you know what's going on, of which operators are active and which ones have their gain actually switched up. So as well as those simple uh, visual feedback things on the algorithm diagram here, we have some basic controls in the operator section. We have the frequency, coarse and fine controls that can be controlled over here. And we have the overall level of the operator as we just saw. And I'll look at the frequency, uh, fine and coarse in a second over here in the main oscillator section. But it's nice to know that you have access to those here at all times. Finally, we've got a copy button. If I hit that, operator six is now copied and I can drop it onto operator one through five simply by hitting the download button. So I hit four. Four is now a duplicate of operator six. Very straightforward stuff. I guess the final thing to mention on the algorithm window in case uh, you've not come across it, this loop around number six, or in some cases you can see it goes around, for example here, four, five, and six are in a loop. It's a feedback loop. It creates uh, a wire out the bottom of four and back into the top of six in this case. In this case, it just creates a loop around six. That feedback loop is controlled with this feedback uh, knob here. That's really the essence of the operator section, which is used, as I say, in conjunction with the algorithm diagram. So the controls for those operators. Now, as you saw, if I switch, if I click on operator one, two, three, four, these controls are for the selected operator. So if I select on one, I can change the waveform, say, and if I go on two, you can see that one's still on sign. So these controls are for the selected operator. So let's work through them now. First things first is the oscillator section. This can be turned on or off. Now this is separate to muting the entire operator because the oscillator is just the waveform. We've also got a filter, we've got an output section, envelope level scaling. If we turn off the oscillator, you'll see the entire oscillator section goes dead. Most of the output controls you'll see gray out, but pan stays on, okay? So effectively turning the oscillator off just turns this operator basically into a filter bank with panning. That's something we'll come to in a second, but that's the first thing to bear in mind. You can turn oscillators on or off. Most of the time, you want it on. You want to use this operator to generate a signal, be it a sound or a modulation source. Now on the original DX7, we just had sine waves, but that's not the case in the Arturia. We've got about 20 or so waves here. We've got classics like sine, cosine, triangle, etc. And then we have some waves from a later a Yamaha synthesizer, again based on FM, the TX81Z, which gave you more waveforms to play with. And Arturia have added some of their own, so. So 
So selected saw, as well as bringing up the whole selection there, you can also flick through with these arrows. Okay. In addition to selecting a wave, you can also invert it. You can see the waveform display over here, how that's affecting the uh, sound. On really slow moving waves, uh, which are being used as modulation sources, changing, inverting the, the flow of the wave, so rather than going up then down, it goes down then up. Of course, it's a completely different modulation effect. You'll hear that very clearly on slow moving waveforms where they're kind of behaving like an LFO. That's the, the real reason for the invert, but it's also nice to add a little bit of variation between different waves on different operators. Next, we have a detune button, which just narrowly repitches the oscillator. There's no great sort of range on that because you have some quite comprehensive tuning controls in a second. But that's just there to simply detune away from the pure pitch. Now, there are two ways of setting the frequency of an operator. One is ratio, which is another way of saying that the, uh, the oscillator tracks the keyboard as in it plays the note you're playing. And then it's fixed, which means regardless of what note you play, this operator will always produce the same frequency. Now I'll just pitch this up a bit so we hear it. Okay, regardless of what note I'm playing, I get a fixed frequency. So let's look at ratio for a second. Ratio effectively is like a multiplier of whatever frequency you play. So you know, A is 440 hertz, if I play an A and the ratio is one, then I get 440 times one, which is 440, so I'll get that A I expected. If I take the ratio up to two, I get it doubled, which is an octave higher. If I drop it down to a half, I get an octave lower down to a quarter, two octaves lower. So that's pretty straightforward. It's behaving so far kind of like an octave switch that you might encounter on an analog keyboard. However, as well as the octaves, which are, for example, one where you started two, half, a quarter, if you take it up to four, you go above another octave, but in between we've got three. So we've actually got steps between the pure octave. We've got sort of fifths and fourths and so on. So you can get different stuff than just octaves. So I'll flick through and you'll hear. In addition to that, we've also got a multiplier which can range up to the, uh, the next step. So for example, now this will take us up to the next octave. So with that fine and coarse tuning, you can pretty much pick out any frequency you want to. The same applies with fixed, where you simply just enter the, uh, the hertz you require. You can either double click down to zero, roll it in, sweep it around, whatever you want. And the really low settings, as you can hear effectively, it's almost sub-audible. You can hear individual clicks of the wave there as it re-triggers. And as I mentioned before, if you look back to the six operators, if I switch to fixed, that same information is displayed there and can be controlled similarly from here. Same with ratio, we get the coarse control and the fine. So I'll put this back to one for now, just so we've got something to work with. The next is OSC Sync. Now, this is not the same as OSC Sync you tend to find on an analog keyboard, which is about resetting the waveform regardless of what pitch it has to follow another waveform. And if that's babble to you, don't worry about it. it doesn't matter. It's not on this synth. What OSC Sync in the Arturia DX7V is, is simply do all the operators, well, the, the selected OSC Sync switched on, you see the on button there, do the operators that are switched into OSC Sync. When you hit a key, do all the waveforms, re-trigger and start from scratch. Uh, you might be wondering what it's going to do, so rather than me explain, I'll just play it for you. So, in this algorithm, operators 1 and 3 are the audible operators, the, uh, the operators above them act as modulators. So I'm going to turn operator 3 up, and as I said before, you can look down there, you see it's now active. So we've now got operator 1 and operator 3. I'm going to put this on a sawtooth as well. Okay, currently they're both set to OSC sync. And this means they should both re-trigger that sawtooth as I press a note. 
And you see there, every time I played it, exactly the same sound because the two waves are triggering perfectly in sync every time. Now I'm going to turn the OSC sync off on operator three, and you will hear that now operator three is what we call a free running oscillator. Whenever I hit the note, wherever the wave is, it just starts playing, it doesn't reset. And this means the two waves are going to exhibit between the sort of the one that's fixed and the one that's free running, a constantly changing relationship of phase, which just sounds like this. As you can hear, the tonality is always changing as they go in and out of phase with each other. Why you want to use this is in this current setting where the two aren't synced, you get a much wider kind of organic living kind of sound, which we will often attribute to being that sort of famous analog warmth. Or if you want that certainty that a couple of waveforms are going to create exactly the same tonality every time, then you stick them both on OSC sync. Very much a sound design choice, there's no right or wrong, obviously, as with all of this stuff. You know, anything I'm telling you about how to do it, feel free to do it differently. This is just how the synth's wired to make sense, but if you're doing things another way, go ahead. Okay, moving on. The pitch envelope. As with OSC sync, it's simply an on-off at this point. There is a single pitch envelope which is applied to any or all of the six operators, and that decision is simply made by deciding if it has the pitch envelope on, then it will be swept by it. If it's off, it won't. Um, we'll look at the envelopes properly in a minute, but to show you what this does, on the envelope window, we go to pitch, and if I pull out this envelope here, we will find, there we go, a four stage envelope. And so that will give us a sweep up and then back down. So what I will do is go back to where we were. We've now got a pitch program into the envelope. And if I turn it off, on one and three as before if i turn it on for one and three that pitch bend that i just programmed in that way uh, is now playing i can turn it off for say operator three and leave operator one with the pitch bend so it's a per operator choice so some of these things can be swept by the pitch, others not. This is a great way for creating, when you're uh, using a modulator into a carrier, it's a great way for creating sort of slidey, swirling effect noises. So that's the pitch envelope, and that essentially is the oscillator section. As I said before, you can switch it on or off if you want to uh, bypass it and simply use the filter from this operator in that chain. You have a wave, an invert, a small detune, controller frequency, whether the waves trigger together, and a pitch envelope. Now we're going to look at the filter section. I'll turn operator 3 back down for this. So we're just now working with operator 1 again. OK, so we have this sawtooth wave. Now Arturia have added a filter in compared to the original DX7's uh, architecture. There was no filter. The filter's quite simple. There's no envelope control of the cutoff or any of that stuff. It's simply you set the cutoff, you set the resonance. So let's just hear quickly how that sounds. I use the resonance it emphasizes the frequencies at the cutoff point which in English we call squelch and it's got plenty of it so there you go that's a simple low pass cutoff resonance you have a choice of filter types it needn't be low pass if I click on here we can have low band or high and also I can just flick through the arrows there's the low pass the band pass the high pass Final control in the filter section is keyboard follow. I'll just switch back to low pass for this. It's a little easy to hear. So keyboard follow means that as I play lower notes, the cutoff will be closed down further. And as I play higher notes, it will be opened up brighter. So I will just switch keyboard follow on. And as I move up through the octaves, you can hear down these lower octaves, it's really closing down until eventually it shuts it out completely. So that's keyboard follow, just simply opens the filter up as you play higher up the keyboard. That's the filter section. Now we can, later on when we come to the mod section, despite what I said earlier, we can actually apply LFOs or envelopes to this cutoff if we want to do more complex things. But as it's wired currently, it's simply a static cutoff. Okay, now we're gonna pull this resonance back a bit and we'll pull the cutoff back up to the top so it's not doing anything. As with the oscillator, I can turn the filter off. 
Moving to the output section, the first thing we encounter is the feedback control. Now, you might remember a minute ago I was showing you the feedback loop in the algorithm controlled with this knob here. That is how Yamaha set up the, the feedback in the DX7. Now, what Arturia have done is they've added another feedback loop, which is that every single one of these operators has a feedback loop to itself, much as six generally had here on the, uh, the DX7. On the Arteria DX7V, every one of them has its own feedback loop into itself. Now, obviously, if they drew all these feedback loops on, this diagram would start to get insanely messy. But that's effectively what's going on. We've got the choice on every single operator, one through six, to create a feedback loop into itself. If you're additionally using the algorithm feedback loop, then they're sort of stacked on top, as in the depth of that one is added to this one. So things can get very, very overloaded. So you have to kind of keep balancing that. So within a single operator, operator one, I'm going to run the feedback up. You can hear what effect that has on the tonality. So you get these wonderfully bright, harsh metallic tones just before the whole thing breaks down into pretty much noise. So the feedback is to be used carefully to kind of get these, uh, these really interesting tones in there. That kind of more subtle settings. You can hear it's kind of a slightly more musical sound. Okay, the next control is AM Sense, which is Amplitude Modulation Sensitivity. Now, Amplitude Modulation is another word for tremolo, where you sort of uh, turn the volume of a sound up and down in a kind of regular LFO style. On the DX7V, that's done with LFO1, which we'll come to in the mod section. And the depth of this Amplitude Modulation is controlled in two ways. One, globally here, with this AMD button. And second, at a per operator level, how much this operator will respond to that control. So for example, if we've got operator one on, amplitude mod sense is zero, it's not gonna to respond to it at all. So I can press the, uh, the key and then turn this knob and nothing will happen. If I now turn amplitude mod sense up and turn this, you'll hear. If I go to a higher setting, it'll be even more pronounced. And as you heard there on a lower setting, it's more subtle. So you're setting per operator how they will respond to this global control. So some operators can be unaffected, others can be very affected. And this, of course, will create quite interesting modulation consequences in these long chains. Next, we have velocity sensitivity. Currently, again, it's set to zero. So regardless of how hard I play, exactly the same volume comes out. If I set it all the way up to full, you'll hear Quite easy, quite straightforward. And last of all, we have panning. Which does what it says on the tin. I'm gonna stop there and we'll move on in a second to look at the envelope and the level scaling. And then we will finish up looking at these global controls. So I'm gonna get another mouthful of tea, you do the same, and back in just two secs. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please, we'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.